This client commissioned us to create a new conference table for their office space and they selected a slab of Bastone Walnut. This particular slab was extremely warped and was too warped for us to get the thickness we needed for the final tabletop. So we had to come up with a unique solution to be able to yield the maximum thickness out of this slab. In order to do that, we opted to break this slab in half right in the middle. So first thing we do is we get all the team together to safely lift this piece down from our slab rack and then we can take it into our back shop, set it down on some dunnage and begin trimming off the excess pieces of wood that are going to need to come off so that we can get this slab to fit into the mold. These cuts that we're doing right now are always intentionally done oversized to the final size of the piece. You would never want to cut your slab to its final piece when you put it in the mold because almost always you're going to have to trim off some excess product to get a nice clean edge on your finished table. So to do that we're just using our skill saw and because we're not really worried about a clean cut at the moment we're not using a track, we're not doing it in multiple passes, we're just doing it the quick and dirty way so that this will fit in our mold. So in order to accomplish this break, we made a few relief cuts in the bottom side of the slab and then we just got all of our guys to jump on either end of the piece to physically break it in half. By the way, I'm making all of this up as I go. broken in half, we can now begin the debarking process and the blending process of that broken edge. So in order to get a strong bond during a resin pour, you have to remove all of the bark from the outside edge of your piece of wood. And we specifically don't recommend that you seal that edge of the wood prior to your main pour because it greatly compromises the strength of the bond. There's other YouTubers you'll see doing this style of table and they will swear by sealing the edges because it reduces the amount of air bubbles and that is absolutely true but the reason that they have to seal their edges is because number one they're not controlling the environment that they're pouring in and cooling it like they should be and number two they're not using a high quality resin that's designed to have its own bubble release without the sealed edges if you seal your edges you just get a plastic on plastic bond even if you sand it it is nowhere near as strong as pouring your deep resin directly on that exposed edge because without sealing you essentially form thousands of little fingers that soak directly into the edge of that piece of wood. Now on to the design of this piece. This is a pour that we have never done something like before and the client wanted us to introduce custom colors to tie into his company colors. So to accomplish this we first pour a black base layer, we let that cure, we sand the surface so that we can achieve a mechanical bond and then we come along and pour our clear top layer. So this is pretty typical to what we usually do but we're going to cut away from the table for a second and show you the samples we created for the next pour. So here here are the four samples that we created for this client and funny enough none of them ended up being what was seen in the final product of the table. Fortunately though the client was very understanding with this and he wanted you know us to have some creative freedom and make just something that we thought was beautiful. So let me explain our process here. Like you already saw, we did the black base layer, then we pour the clear top layer. The difference between these four samples is how long we waited to then come and add the red and white resin that you're seeing. So this was too long. We only got a bit of epoxy that went down past the surface. And then looking at the top, it's ugly, honestly. You can't see any depth and you would completely lose the whole point of the base layer. But Haley and I were actually talking, looking at this, it does look kind of cool upside down. So maybe this is an idea for a table where we pour it upside down and then we machine off the ugly layer and just have these little fingers coming out. Then this one, we waited a little bit less time. We got more epoxy that came down, but this time it kind of came in like these big blobs. This one, we waited even less time, so the product was more liquid and you can see that some of it settled down to the bottom, some of it stayed wispy throughout the center of this piece, but still not quite what we were after. We thought a little bit too much sunk to the bottom. Then this one, we left it for even less time for that clear layer to pour, or clear layer to cure rather, and you can see in this case nearly all of that resin soaked down to the bottom. So for the final product that you're about to watch us do, we did somewhere, actually, 
a little more cured than this. It would be somewhere in between these two is essentially what the table ended up being. We, I think this one was like uh, 24 hours after the pour and this was like 12 hours after the pour so we ended up doing like 17 hours for the table. So let's go see how that turned out. You only want to drip it where you want to. You don't want to have strings between your grips. Yeah. So you need to like wipe it every time. Wow, this is, uh, this is something. Just wait, I want to see what this does. Before we do more, I need to see how it reacts. I'm having a hard time with this. Oh, at best, it will look like one of the samples. At worst, it's going to stay like it is. <laughs> well, it's, it's sinking, so it'll, it'll shift around. Yeah. It is, the red is getting down, so that's good. That gives me hope. The white's sinking over here. Yeah, the yeah. white's sinking then. But it's almost sinking too much. No, that's oh, what it was. But we've also asking. started, and oh, there's no going back now. We have to make it all even. So let's keep going. If all else fails, I can, like, stab them all with a popsicle stick, yeah. and it'll move them around a bit. Yeah, I think this is probably... But I'll do that in, like, an hour. Yeah. I'll give it a little bit of time. So you could, like, double the amount you've done here then? It's not a phone call, it's my timer to check this table. Do you want me to turn it off? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Stop. We can do that and same thing, come back through with like a straight line through the middle and kind of mix them all Put a, bit. a fan on it. I don't know if that would help the with this The fan point, just though. like blew them sideways. Okay, yeah. so we'll do this all the way through. What do you think, John? And make it look oh, good. You agree? That's better than yeah. This. Yeah, so and then I think... It's a little bit wispier. It should convect. It will convect a bit. Just leave the fans off. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I told him that it's unpredictable. Like, it was hard enough to try to match that sample. Yeah. Like, I had to make four and they all look so different. Yeah. And that's nothing similar to doing it on an actual table. After the piece has sat in the mold for seven days and we've got it demolded, then it's back downstairs onto our CNC machine to remove that excess layer of resin from the surface. So we purposely pour this extra layer of resin on top so that we can try and fill in all the cracks and voids in a single shot. It ends up being much more cost effective for us to do it this way instead of taking the extra time in labor to go and individually fill all those voids in. Once the piece is off the CNC machine, then it's over to a workbench and Randy is going to begin cutting this piece down to its final size. So this is a 12 foot long by four foot wide conference table that our client has ordered. And we usually make our pieces one inch larger in each direction when they go into the mold. So that allows us to cut that one inch strip off each of the outside edges and we just get a really nice clean finished edge. Now, this table is full of a lot of different things than we usually do. This client, since it's a conference table, wants to have their company logo engraved right into the center of the table. And you can see our inspiration for that there on the sheet of paper. So in order to achieve the perfect design for the client's logo, we had to perform this in two stages. So Randy is using our Shaper router and he's milling out for the initial pour right now. And the first color that we're doing is a black resin. So this is going to be that outside shadow line that's gonna outline the text. And then after this is cured, we will add the red. So technically, this pour could have been done with our coat thin resin as it's rated for quarter inch thick pours. But in order to get the strongest bond possible, we opt to use our deep resin for this. So it does delay the whole process. We have to wait one week for this resin to cure instead of seven days. But like I mentioned earlier when it came to sealing edges, using the deep resin, it allows that resin to soak into the pores of the wood and almost like concrete where you get rebar and it forms a much more permanent bond. So after that week has elapsed, we put the piece onto our CNC machine again, then we flatten off that excess layer of resin. Before we can stick that tape down for the Shaper router, we're just wiping everything down with alcohol to get any dust and debris off, but it also kind of gives us a sneak peek of what the finished product will look like. 
And I should probably explain how this machine that Randy's using works. So the tape that you see with little dominoes on it that we've laid down onto the table essentially gives a map for the router to know what it's machining. There's a camera on the back side of the router where you see those lights, and it is reading the design of those dominoes on the table, and each domino has a unique pattern. So by placing that on there, the router knows where to cut and where not to cut, and that's how we're able to achieve this perfect shape here without using any jigs. For the next step of the process, we're mixing up a metallic red resin, again with our deep resin, pouring that in so it's flush with the other surface and then we have to wait another week for this to cure before we can remove that excess layer of resin. Now that we've got the logo poured on the piece, we can start working on our sanding process for this table. So since this has epoxy in it, we're gonna sand this all the way up to 320 grit. We start at 120 and go in order from 120, 150, 180, 240, and finally 320. Once we've got that sanding done, we can begin laying out for the leg pockets that are going on the underside of this table. This step is something that isn't necessary, but it's a small detail that we like to do just to further increase the quality of the piece. So the plate that mounts the legs to the underside of our table is six millimeters or a quarter inch thick. And we could just screw right through that, but then you would actually feel that lip for anyone running their hands on the underside of the table. So by recessing this into the table, we have a completely flush surface underneath. Then once we've got all the pockets done, we're routing out a two millimeter, 45 degree bevel for the outside edge of this table. And this is just to take away that sharp edge that's left from the saw. This is a custom detail as well. Our clients have the option to choose this, but almost all of them go with that small little bevel. Now we're going to take a drill and put a hole right in the top of this tabletop for a good reason. Since it is a conference table, they want power integration here. So we're routing out for a Mocket power box in this piece. And doing that will allow our client to have power coming up from the floor, run underneath the table, and then into a plug where they can charge their phone or their laptop. Then once we've got all of those details finished up, we can grab some of our Black Forest Coat Thin Resin and begin filling in all of the small imperfections that are still left on that surface. Even though we did over pour for our initial pour, you still can't get away from having to do some fills, so we like to use the Black Forest Coat Thin for that. And since they are so small, we're not using the deep resin since we're not as worried about adhesion for something so tiny. Now, unfortunately, since this table was a little bit of a rush and our finisher sprayed it on the weekend, we did not get to go and film the spray finishing process. But this table did get multiple coats of the two component acrylic urethane finish that we always do for the clients that select that option. It is the more durable finish option that we offer, but even still, we add an extra coat of our Black Forest ceramic coating because it further increases the durability and protection of this piece, and it also beautifies it. Like, you could probably notice where you could see those overlap marks where the ceramic had been applied compared to where it hadn't been, it almost looks like there's an Instagram filter placed over the wood. You can really see it here in this shot. You're welcome, Garrett. Okay, so you do this and then that locks it in. As if it's in that much, that's locked in now. As long as you get that angle with the clip in. Spinder. We'll do it from the bottom. Oh, good. Otherwise. Garrett, you smell like my older brother. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. And we don't ship the table with these boxes in just so there's no damage that happens during transportation. These tables get shipped by truck, so if we were to leave that in and it's vibrating and rattling the whole time, there's a pretty good chance you're going to mess up your finish and scratch it. And finally, we're installing the hardware that's going to fasten these legs to the underside of the table. So like always, we use threaded inserts because it allows our clients to disassemble and reassemble their table as many times as they like without stripping out any of those holes. 
Once we get our threaded inserts in, we can get the tabletop flipped over and do one final test fit on the legs to ensure that everything is going to work perfectly for our client when they set this table up. We have the table all finished up, ready to send off to our client. I think we're just waiting to hear from them on when they want to take delivery of this piece. It is going down to Philadelphia, so we're going to be packaging it up in a crate and sending it off to them. Unfortunately, we're not delivering this piece, but we will likely be getting some photos from the client, so we'll be sure to post those on some of our other platforms. And I just really hope that you guys enjoyed watching this video. I guess I'll recap everything that was used to build this table. So this is an incredibly figured piece of Bastone Walnut that we bought during one of our trips to GL Veneer some time ago. So you guys can go watch one of those videos if you'd like. And then we've done a three-stage pour with our Black Forest Deep Resin. So there's a black base layer, a clear top layer, and then a red and white addition in that top layer. And then we've also added union roofing and resin using our Shaper Router to the top. The whole table was then sprayed with an acrylic urethane, which we unfortunately missed filming. It wasn't our fault. <laughs> and then we've protected everything with our Black Forest ceramic coating. Specifically, we've used the sprayable graphene on this piece, uh, just because it's way easier to apply on a large surface like this and if you guys felt we've deserved it if you think there was enough work that went into this table or hey even if you hate the table you should give us a like or leave a comment uh, we really appreciate it it means a lot and we'll see you next time he acts so stoic when he's on camera I know. completely indifferent to everything